everyone, and welcome to Samantha Politics, a show where we talk about global politics and women's rights. We have a great show coming up. Uh, Deb Halen was confirmed as our first Native American Secretary of the Interior. Now, this is really monumental because for a long time, the Interior Department was used specifically to oppress. An amazing show lined up for you today. We've got Stephanie Foster and Susan Markham here from Smash Strategies. They're gender experts, both served in the Obama administration. So without further ado, I'm going to bring in Ambassador Revere. Well, hi, and Samantha, it's great to be with you. You're so energized. I feel energized. Oh, good. I'm so excited. I also want to encourage you, look for ways that you can help out coming up to the election, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. What brought you out here today? This is also history in the making. We had the largest voter turnout in American history in the midst of a global pandemic. And we're always asking ourselves the question, where are the women and girls what is the women's perspective on this? In particular today, we're going to be focusing on Afrin, which you can see vis-a-vis -vis the green that it's now occupied by the Turkish army. Do you see any relationship between the protest movement in Russia and the move towards democracy in, in Belarus and the protests in Belarus? Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, the connection is very clear, and I think even Navalny himself has pointed out it several times. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Samantha Politics. As usual, we have an amazing feminist guest on our show tonight. The research found that these women operationalized inclusivity. They excelled at building bridges and alliances, and they practiced something called collective leadership. Uh, unfortunately, I don't sing opera on this show, but, you know, there's always tomorrow. We'll see, maybe I'll change tunes and start singing opera. He does the same, this is out of Putin's playbook. So what do you think would actually motivate him to take a step back? Yeah, no, that's a very salient observation. And you know, if they were able to do that while she had control and she's supposedly dedicated to human rights, what the heck happens to the Rohingya now? Right, so I think it's, it's difficult. A lot of us in America have gotten messages from people that are really desperate and their lives are a threat um, by the Taliban. Is there anything that, you know, advice that you've been giving to women that, you know, people watching this show might be able to heed that's helpful? I mean, I think the big thing that the voice team has really been talking about lately is, is compassionate communication. If you as the, the president or, you know, whoever it is, you're trying to rack up support for a war or to intervene and you say, hey, everybody, this may be not Operation Freedom, but Operation Enduring Freedom for 20 years. I mean, do you think the American public would support that? It's the word operation that might need to be changed, okay. right? It's a situation. <laughs> We're feeling a little bit scared or nervous about getting their vaccine. So this is what they decided to do. Zach, if you could play that video for us. You really mention how corruption and kleptocracy were two of the things that really mangled our operation. In, I love that it was called Operation Enduring Freedom. I just such an eye roll. Um, <laughs> can you explain how, how? How did our misunderstanding of corruption and kleptocracy kind of screw us over? Um, because we did it in all the wrong ways. And because Aung San Suu Kyi was a very, very well-loved um, human rights activist who was imprisoned during the time of the military dictatorship in Burma. And she was under house arrest for years and years and years and then became the president. And what happened is that her party just won in a resounding landslide. And so the military got scared about having power and control, even though they actually have a section of the government under the constitution. One of the things you talk about is challenging bots. Like if we're talking about the path that people get to to become extremists and that ecosystem around it, so much of that, and you talk about this, your book has to do with social media and looking things up. Ah, so she has a great chapter called Shake Google, which is that like young Muslims don't uh, that they they rely on a Google search or on a YouTube influencer more than they do a scholar which is something that we got wrong. So talk about actually countering violent extremism. What have you seen that has worked, whether it's a chat bot or whatever, to, to get people off that path? Okay, so let's, let's, let's use an example that is current and right now. Okay, let's Great. think about QAnon. So she kind of knows what she's doing, FYI, with regards you to would, You would think, right? <laughs> <laughs> she, kind of, she kind of knows what's going on. I mean, if The Economist was citing your research, I would say, I would say we can trust Maria. I know your family has been trying to get out. Can you tell us a little bit about your family and, you know, where, what's their, 
Are they out of the country? What was that process like? How did they get out? Uh, fortunately, my family is out and they're in a safe place. And then also to center women in the rebuilding, to center civil society organizations. Obviously, the aid that we've been providing to Haiti hasn't really worked that well at stabilizing the country. So we really need to look, re-look at how we're providing aid, who we're supporting, and clearly supporting this, the you know, the Haitian government, which just is going like this all over the place, kind of reminds me of our tactic in Afghanistan, which is support a centralized government that had no support of the people versus supporting more civil society actors. I think that's it for this night's episode of Samantha Politics. We'll see you next week. Take care, everyone. Good night.